Hi to everyone and thank you all for joining this webinar today and hope that you're all doing well and mainly keeping safe in this period of time. And the best I can hope is that we get over this pandemic issue as soon as possible and with less damage as possible. So the topic we are going to be exposing today relates to a great device, the articulator, that has been used in dentistry for many years and has evolved constantly over time. And with the integration of the digital technology in the dental field, the articulator has once again evolved. And thanks to Mr. Enrico Steger, founder of Zirkonzan, and Mr. Udo Plaster, who got together and created this amazing digital workflow known as the plane system, which is composed by an articulator, a plane finder, with an added value of a face hunter and a plane analyzer. So the PS1 articulator, besides its elegant appearance, it also has some very interesting features that is worthwhile looking into. And uh, we'll analyze that uh, further through the program today. And this articulator does come with a variety of, of inserts, the six Bennett angle inserts for immediate side shift movement, the six condylar inserts for the protrusive movements, and an additional 12 inserts uh, that six relate to the sutrusion movements and six to the, to the detrusion movements. And we also have a custom incisal um, anterior guide table. And not least the plane positioner or the adjustable mounting plate which <coughs> we utilize for the mounting of uh, of the models the second component is <coughs> is the plane finder which instead is the device by means of which we manually gather information necessary to transfer the maxilla into a physical articulator Manually, so this procedure is done manually, and with the integration of the the face hunter, uh, we open up a path to a direct digital transfer uh, of the maxillary model to to the virtual articulator. And. As the cherry on the cake, there is the plane analyzer, which is basically a pantograph by means of which we capture individual intraoral recordings of the patient's movement and utilize this data to set our, our articulator. And seeing that the topic today is <coughs> related to the articulator, here it is. Um, Besides the great appearance of the articulator, this PS1 articulator belongs to the Archon family of articulators where the condyles are situated at the bottom body of the device. And besides the protrusive and lateral retrusive movements, we can also adjust uh, the retrusive movements, therefore classifying the PS1 as a, as a fully adjustable articulator. This articulator was conceived based on studies performed by Professor Alfred Giese, studies that relate to the dynamic movements of the mandible and in specific to the combination of the rotation and translation of the condyle during the movement. And according to these studies, in order to perform an ideal geometry of these combined movements on a mechanical device. The center of rotation needs to be shifted to the mastoid process. As shown in, in the image. And this is one of the primary characteristics of the PS1 articulator. And the advantage comes when in those situations we need to directly open the bite on the articulator 
by increasing the vertical dimension and this increased movement will follow the geometry of the radius of the combined movement with the center of rotation that's placed on the mastoid instead of falling backwards like it would happen if the center of rotation was placed on the condyles. Avoiding high contacts on the anterior region. Another element <coughs> to keep in consideration in relation to the articulator itself is the relation of a reference to the center of rotation. And on the PS1 articulator, the distance of the first molar to the center of rotation is a 90 millimeters. As in for the Panadens system, the reference is the central incisor and the distance to the hinge axe is 100 millimeters. And this 90 millimeters is established in a point where it intersects with the vertical plane, the plane of occlusion and the radius of the sphere with fulcrum on the mastoid process. And these are basically all the fundamental um, elements that we need to know about this articulator, which <clears throat> I do believe is, is a complete mechanical device to our disposal in order to perform any functional movement necessary. So, coming to the big question is, why do we need an articulator? The best answer I can give you here comes from a great mentor, and it's simply <clears throat> as we need a mechanical device that can produce the dynamic movements of the mandible that are not influenced by proprioceptor sensors and muscles activity, therefore develop a pure mechanical movement. And with this in mind, I do believe that the use of an articulator is fundamental for any type of rehabilitation. And at the end of the day, everything comes down in seeking the harmony between the dynamic and the static elements involved in the masticatory system. And with this said and with this <coughs> entered in our memories, we can just move forward with some practical use of the articulator itself. So, uh, wonderful. So welcome to my, my gypsum room uh, in a little small black box and in the digital world it's actually known as, as our scan software. This is basically where as in our gypsum room we set up the models in the articulator. It's the area where we prepare the models, where we trim them, we get them ready, we set them up, and we do mount them in, uh, in the articulator. So, what I'm going to do today is just a very simple simulation of a real case that <coughs> goes through a daily procedure where a patient goes to the doctor's office and for his annual checkup and his hygiene procedures and just notice a couple of light recessions on this young patient's tooth, like in the area of this molar, in this area here, and a couple of very small recessions on, on the lower jaw. Well, this is just a very small red flag, but to get a better understanding of what is going on, you would like to perform a functional evaluation of, uh, of the dynamic movements of the patient. And before uh, initiating any complicated procedure, just have a quick and a fast evaluation of, uh, of this uh, functional movement. And we receive the models uh, in our laboratory, we have the opportunity to set them up, we scan them, we prepare them, we digitalize them. And it's in the scan software where we have the opportunity to set them up in, uh, in the articulator. And here it is, once it's set up, we have 
and let me take all these elements away which we don't need at the moment so in in the actual software we have different functions but before entering the function themselves let me just present to you the the, the gypsum room that we have so on a shelf or in in our <coughs> cabinet we have the opportunity to set all our articulators that are in relation to the ones uh, that the doctor has in his office. So in our laboratory, we're working with, with doctors that are using different type of articulators. So we have the opportunity to choose that specific articulator. It needs to go through a recorded process in order for it to appear on this shelf. And once recorded, we will have the exact same physical articulator digitalized on on our computer um, the phase of going of digitalizing this this computer uh, or recording this computer or this um, this articulator uh, we won't mention that today if anybody needs any extra information in relation to how to register their articulator you can get in contact with us and we'll be very happy to um, to help you with with that but these are the articulators and you can select any one of these that you have basically registered. We have uh, a couple of uh, casting mount uh, options. One can be used by using the actual face of the patient. Then there's the option of the plane finder, uh, option of mounting the model on the articulator. And the third option is the manual option. And this is the option we are going to do today. The doctor has not performed any recordings besides picking up a centric relation, actually, sorry, a centric occlusion, and uh, from here, just perform a very, very simple functional evaluations. On the bottom part, we have the opportunity to set the offsets of the condyles. Let me just throw this over quickly, and you can see that by moving these elements, just hold on a sec, we can activate the offset of the condyles. Certainly to be able to perform this, we are going to need very, very specific recordings. So at the moment with the therapy that we are going to go through today, we are not going to mess around with these values. So we'll keep them on zero, but it's just to let you know that you have the options to create offsets uh, on, um, on the hinge axe or on the center of, on the center of rotation. There is the opportunity to change the angle, therefore open and close the articulator to your knees. It's, it's limit, unlimited, you can bring it right over 12, 13, 14 millimeters, so it is um, unlimited in relation to how we uh, can open and close the articulator. It's <coughs> on the right hand side in our group functions, we certainly have the models uh, that we have scanned and brought them into uh, the workflow, the articulator itself, which we can bring on the screen or eliminate and utilize or eliminate every single component of the articulator to our needs and our necessities. And a couple of references such as the mounting plate, which is very useful in specific situations, and, and the plane finder, which is a great reference that we are going to utilize today um, in, uh, in mounting our models and certainly we have all our uh, planes of occlusion so we have the horizontal we have the frontal or the vertical plane and we have the medium plane which is the sagittal plane of occlusions and by means of all these references we are going to uh, set up our our model directly on on the digital on the digital articulator. This process has been performed for many years in the analog world with its difficulties and just by bringing all this information into the digital world will make you understand how easier this process can be performed and how quick and fast we can move through a procedure of such type. Up at the top we just have the window that relates to the groups, the window that relates to the cast mount which we'll be using today anything that needs to be matched can be performed in this window and uh, any files that need to be imported into the software can be imported exported we can add any type of 2d pictures 
to, to, uh, to the workflow and add any type of extra references and this will be something that we'll be using today and if you need to cut your scans you have the options of that, uh, that as well. It's basically sort of your trimming process that we perform in the gypsum room. Our <coughs> scan mode relates to um, the, the, the task list. This task list is created through the archive. Uh, while we were selecting the actual project, here we just selected uh, two models as healthy and uh, in order for us to be able to, form, to perform the functional evaluations, we have not included any type of, of therapy at the moment. Um, and uh, that's basically it uh, in relation to what we have in our, in our scan software. So the procedure of the actual setup in the articulator manually with absolutely no data is going to bring us to have to utilize average data that is to, to our disposal. One of the first things that we do need to keep in consideration is the absolute midline. And as a reference, we are not going to keep in consideration the midline of the patient, but we are going to keep in consideration the midline of, uh, of the patient's midline seam. Let me open up my articulator mount, and I am going to select my move models freely. Uh, by means of moving these arrows left and right, we have the opportunity to move the model in any direction we want. And the goal is when we actually um, bring the model to the occlusal part, we want to center the midline seam of, of the patient. So we will not keep in consideration the teeth, but the actual midline seam of the patient. This midline seam falls exactly in, uh, in the middle of, of an articulator. So our first step is related to the fact that <coughs> the middle, the skeleton middle of the patient falls exactly in the middle of our, our articulator. The second reference that we are going to keep in consideration is where are we going to place this model in space in relation to, uh, to the articulator itself. And by utilizing the plane finder is a good element <laughs> to utilize in order to find the vertical uh, height of the model in, in, uh, in the articulator itself. The third important element is what we mentioned earlier on and it is the distance of the molar to the hinge axe and we know that it is 90 millimeters. So by utilizing a, a very interesting tool, our ruler, and with the axis offset we are able to find the distance to the hinge axe and this model is already mounted so I don't need to move it around all that much by the center of rotation of the center of mastication of the first motor to the hinge axe it's placed at 90 millimeters and <coughs> it is located on the plane of the plane finder the third very important element that we need to keep in consideration is certainly the pitch of, uh, of the model which refers to the ala tragus. I do not have an image of the patient to, to actually locate the ala tragus plane, so I am going to use an average value. And as we know, um, the planes of occlusion uh, move or are considered to be in, in a value of round about minus 4 degrees to round about a 14 degree. The average between uh, these, uh, these tops is, uh, is around about 6 degrees. So in order to set this model with an average uh, in the pitch, I am going to use another plane, which is in my scan actions and in my reference objects. By activating and opening up my reference objects, I have a couple of solutions. I can actually bring into my workflow the plaster plane, which is the one that I will be utilizing. We can utilize the Panadin plane. We can create individual planes and we can bring in uh, the sphere of Monson that helps us with, um, with coordinating the curves of Spee and the curves of Wilson. We will utilize the, Panadin, the, the plaster plane in this situation. And, and here it is. Let me take some elements away. 
and make sure that I place this plane in the right position. And by moving it up and down, you have the opportunity to move this plane up and down. I am going to place it right on the plane finder. We have to remember that the plane finder is our zero reference in space and the angle that is formed by the zero reference and the pitch is, is the angle that we are looking for. <clears throat> on, the, on the plaster plane, we have the opportunity to set it based on the dimension of the teeth. We can use our ruler to measure the dimension of the central incisor. I already know that this one is around about nine millimeters, so this is the one that I will be selecting and place the actual uh, plaster plane in position by moving it forward a little bit. And there you are, I'm placing the central incisor in position and this line that relates on this specific plane of occlusion is my 90 millimeter plane to the center of rotation. And by placing the plane, I am realizing that everything is coming together. Uh, and now I need to organize the pitch. And if my average value of the pitch is six degrees, I have the opportunity to move the angle and I'm going to bring it to a six degree. And it's usually between 5.56, the average, the average value that we can use. So let me just start with a 5.5 and I'll start it on one side and here we are. Here we have the pitch of the model. Uh, maybe I need to increase it slightly. So if I go back into my cast mount, I can actually go to move my models freely and I can change this pitch and place it to more or less a six degree. The way I like to set it is I would like to see my central incisors. Uh, touching the plane and in this case just perfectly my uh, lingual cusp of the of the first molar on on the plane of occlusion so <clears throat> as you see the six degree is pretty is pretty good on one side and on the other side we can go ahead and evaluate I need to come back in get my references again activate my plane so I can move the second plane of occlusion and, and, and have the same correspondent and get it to touch my buckle cusp. And here now I have the same relation and as you can notice there is a bit of a difference between the right plane and the left plane. This is, this is pretty normal. In, in, in a lot of situations. At this point, I have basically set up my model uh, to perfection according to, uh, to standard values uh, that we have available. And they are really sufficient to start off the first uh, part of the procedure. This is just an evaluation to get an understanding if there is anything worthwhile moving forward through, through, a through, through a therapy. I have everything I need. I have performed a manual setup on, uh, on my virtual articulator. As you have noticed, it's much easier than, uh, and much more accurate than being able to do something like this manually uh, in, like we were performing in the analog world. And happy with what I am, I will be saving the project and the work in my plaster room is terminated and what I will do now is take my articulator into my laboratory where I can sit down in my bench and carry on with, uh, with the evaluations. And now welcome to my, my working bench. This is known in the digital world as, as the modelier software and here I have my models my articulator and my models set in the articulator just like we had performed it 
in, uh, in our gypsum room. On the right side is the central, the central command of the articulator as well. Now what we have done is we have set up the articulator with digital values for the setup and we are going to now set up uh, the articulator with um, average values in relation to the three main elements necessary. We have in our center of command we have our Bennett, our um, eminence which we can organize and coordinate the eminence. You can pay attention on, on the eminence of the condyle, where by moving this little, little sphere, we are able to um, shift and create the angle of the eminence. Usually on a first class of occlusion, uh, the eminence is the average data or value of the eminence is going to be around about 30 degrees so I'm going to bring it to, to 30 degrees on the left and the side. The green little sphere relates to the relates to the the Bennett angle so let me just take this away let me take this away so we can try and see it a little bit better and here we are we are up on on, on the Bennett and this gives me the opportunity to set the Bennett. As you can see, if I move the little sphere, I can set the, ben the, the Bennett angle to, to my desire. And here again, on, the, um, uh, on a standard value in a first class, the Bennett is usually around about 15, 15 degrees. So I'm going to set it to 15 degrees. So I will perform the same function on the other side. And I'm going to just decrease it. Oops, it is. I'm just going to decrease it quickly. Let me grab it. I'm opening up the banner just a little bit so I can have access to my eminence and just bring it down. By scrolling, I can bring it down a little bit easier than by dragging it. And I am at 30 and I'm going to set my Bennett at 15. So I'm scrolling on the little sphere and I'm taking it down to 15 degree. These are just average values that we are going to utilize to perform the first part. This is 15, 7, 15, 4, 15, 1 and 15. Now in relation to the uh, condylar path uh, inserts and and the, um, the Bennett inserts, here is the um, the window where we can open and manage these inserts. So when setting up an articulator <coughs> and uh, asking uh, performance in relation to um, standard values, it's always recommended to utilize a condylar path insert with a flat surface, so I will be selecting this condylar path surface. Let me get to the socket and just eliminate it so we can take a look at it from this side and have an easy view of, of what's actually going on. So here it is. This is the, the white insert with zero degree, degree. If we substitute it with the green one, here we have uh, an elevation uh, from the zero plane that is round about uh, 0 0.8 millimeters. And if we use a red one, we then have an elevation of round about 0. Point, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1.4 millimeters uh, from, from, from the zero plane. And again, if we are going to be planning to utilize the sutrusion movements, we have the opportunity to bring into these inserts. So they are all in this window that relates to the inserts. And now I am just going to bring in my white insert. Let's make sure that I have them backwards and forwards. And what relates to the Bennett angles? Here we are. If I bring in my 
white insert that relates to the bennet angle the immediate side shift on the bennet is zero with uh, with the white insert if we utilize a green one the immediate side shift is around about one millimeter and if we use the red one the immediate side shift is 1.5 millimeters so we have everything we need to our disposal to coordinate any element that relates to to the immediate side shift now certainly we will have this data if we perform some specific intraoral recordings uh, by means of, uh, of a pantograph device but by using average values uh, what is recommended is um, a white condylar uh, insert with zero degree and a green Bennett insert with a one millimeter uh, on the immediate side shift and the articulator at this point is set with the standard values that um, that we are are looking for here we have the opportunity to bring the articulator back to its original shape and my jaws are coming into position I can apply and accept what I have performed I am happy with what I have I am ready to move forward to the next step which is going to be the functional analysis of the articulator itself and in order to start this procedure this is the individual interior plan guide we are not going to use it so I'm going to keep it on zero for today and <coughs> Once we have set and make sure that all our values are set to the standard values, we are going to perform the, the, the movement simulation. The movement simulation is going to read uh, the coordinates that we have just set through the values and the surface of the teeth. It just takes a couple of seconds. And I believe that these recordings are really very, very, very accurate. And here we have our, our model. Now on the bench, I don't know where the camera is, but wherever it is, I do have the original models of the patient and I have already uh, circle the areas of, of abrasion, the areas of interest in relation to this functional evaluation. So I will be keeping those in consideration. My model will come up on the screen and here I have all my uh, centric stops in relation to the centric occlusion contacts. And from here, as we usually perform and whoever does these type of procedures on on, um, on a physical articulator by using all these calibrated papers will understand how easy it is to, to utilize a digital articulator to have these evaluations. So we will start by performing uh, the protrusive movement and just by scrolling we are <coughs> able to evaluate exactly the movement that is occurring on, on the models by following the, the contact. So by scrolling, I think the scroll is about a millimeter each step that we go, so we can count them, the first millimeter, and we understand that during the protrusive movement, we still have a slight encroachment on, on the posterior teeth, the second millimeter, we still have something, the third, we still have something, and the fourth millimeter, the contacts disappear on the molars, and the whole load of, uh, of the protrusive movement is taken basically by a lateral tooth. And this can just make you understand um, the difficulty of such a small tooth with such a small root picking up the load. It carries on after the six, seven, eight, seven millimeters, the load shifts. And at a certain point, the central incisors take the load and bring it up, up to final.
we note all these elements you can actually also just record them so you have them in in a recording for for your memory and now we will perform the the lateral lateral intrusion on the right side so the first millimeter the canine takes the load together with uh, the first molar the second millimeter the first premolar starts getting in contact the third the premolar takes constant the whole load and it brings it up all the way until it meets the canine one more time and at a certain point it disappears and the canine takes the load and if we go and evaluate where the recession is it's right on this tooth so this is a red flag what the doctor saw in the dental office brought him to have a suspicion that there's a, there's probably a, a functional issue on this tooth and this very um, light or very simple evaluation is starting to confirm that this tooth is somehow in jeopardy and it's just laying out the foundations and focusing on specific areas that the doctor can go into the patient's mouth and, and, and evaluate. So we have, we have noticed the first contact. Let's take the left first millimeter. The canine takes the shift. Fantastic. This is fantastic. One, two, and at the second millimeter, this molar starts encroaching on the movement and it disappears completely on the canine. And that's on the second millimeter. So we go to the third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And it takes the load all the way to the eleventh millimeter of the movement and the canine comes back into game. Twelve, thirteen, the canine takes the load. Interested to see what's happened to this canine's point. It's got the half a moon. Therefore, it's under stress compared to the canine on the other side. Another red flag, another flag to evaluate and ask ourselves, well, why is all this happening? It could be that the patient wants to eliminate the contact on this premolar and <laughs> uses, gets into some parafunctional movements and uh, uh, works on the canine and tends to abrade it. So another red flag to evaluate is what's happening on this canine. So let's bring up the lower jaw. And we go into and have an evaluation and see exactly what's going on. We carry the movement and look how the elements actually combined and we can actually follow the trajectory of what's happening on this canine so another red flag to keep in consideration and to and to evaluate we have also noticed that there are some very very odd abrasions on this central incisor like we can notice over here and in the very beginning, we thought it was a chip, but in reality, it is not. It is an actual abrasion that somehow, and for some reason, the patient gets into that position. And by, sorry, and by bringing up our models and performing a wide lateral movement, we start understanding what happens and where and what movement does he do to get onto that abrasion so basically for some reason which we don't understand the patient <clears throat> performs a movement and plays on this central incisor and you can see how the actual abrasion matches in this in this specific point another red flag to keep in consideration and try to get a better understanding why the patient uh, performs these type of parafunctional movements uh, at this point the red flags have been set it it's a good reason for the doctor to have gathered sufficient information to have a seating with the patient and expose 
what he has noticed and um, let him know that there is an opportunity to get into details in relation to uh, um, a better therapy, um, a better analysis of, of the actual situation. Uh, it will be up to the patient to decide if he wants to get um, extra information in relation to uh, his dynamics and if so, uh, the doctor will then initiate uh, the procedure of um, setting up uh, the intraoral recordings, uh, setting up certainly the face bow transfer by means of the plane finder and um, certainly having to um, evaluate the centric relation or the harmony that there is between the centric uh, relation and the centric occlusion. Therefore, we need to go through a um, deprogramming phase of, of, um, of the muscle situation, therefore uh, coordinating and organizing organizing a bite and moving through the therapy. Um, what I can uh, move forward in uh, giving you an idea in relation to what could be happening in the next step is uh, the decision that we need to make in relation to, to, this, to this condition. Um, the decision if uh, we are going to move through an ortho procedure, a decision if we are going to move through a selective odontoplasty on a specific tooth and <coughs> getting a good understanding of how much biologic material are we going to eliminate from that tooth. Now it's always a very, very difficult decision, especially on a healthy tooth to perform an orthoblasty, a selective um, odontoblasty, but if it relates to the fact of being able to save the, the substructure of the tooth. It is really necessary to consider because we do know that Mother Nature will continue until she finds her path through this tooth. So it's really very important to, uh, to have accurate data before we perform any type of odontoblasting. Of but <clears throat> I, I haven't got the actual data of uh, of, uh, of the next step, but I just want you to imagine that we are in this uh, specific situation and uh, we do need to perform an autoblasty. Like in the analog world, we would go ahead and have two or three sets of models uh, placed in our articulator and we would start eliminating uh, biological material to see how much material we need to eliminate here. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's much easier. I just need to uh, go onto the background of my model select extras and utilize my modify scan. Uh, it's not recognizing my dongle for some reason. I hope it doesn't crash on me. Uh, I'm going to select let's retry and this model activates and at this point I can start evaluating my selective odontoplasty. So let's perform the movement, I'm bringing it over, one, two, and here I have my first contact. Here I have my tools that I can utilize. I need to select the tool. I'm going to look at the diameter. I can reduce the diameter of the tool. So I don't have huge alien, and I can reduce the intensity of the tool that I need to use to export uh, to eliminate uh, biologic material and I will activate and start eliminating and performing. I'm going to carry on with the movement. And carry on with the movement. And here's some a little bit here as well. And this is just going to give us an idea of how much biologic material we need to eliminate to get through with the movement and take the load off the premolar, hoping that by taking the stress off that tooth, it's passing all the way. I'm pretty good. Didn't touch the stop centrix. I'm leaving them exactly where they are. I just need to make sure that the passage of that um, premolar is safe and secure. We can apply the, um, uh, 
the expectation and I am going to repeat the movement. So I will have an understanding if I have taken away enough material. I will say yes. And we will then repeat, repeat the movement. Now who is used in doing these procedures in the analog world with all the papers really knows how difficult and complicated it is and, and now can actually realize that by utilizing uh, a digital uh, articulator how easy and how visible everything is in relation to what, to what we need to perform. Okay, I'm back to the first part of the window. I'm going to reactivate the movement. So it'll be carry on, it'll carry on reading the surfaces of, of the teeth and it'll tell me if that contact is still there or not. just takes a couple of seconds to, to calculate and now it is done so let's get back to visualizing what we've done here we are and let's perform the movement so one two three there's still a contact four five six a little bit better than before but I need to eliminate a little bit more material so I'll go back to extra I will modify my scan I will activate it go back into my tools reduce the diameter and perform the movement one two three and I'm going to eliminate it and here and I have a little bit here this selective odontoblast can be performed on one tooth or it can be performed on both in this specific situation I prefer doing it on only on one and it also really does depend on how much material you're going to have to eliminate. Theoretically I'm moving through, I can apply and now I will repeat the movement to see if we are free. So we go back to the first part, we reactivate the articulator so it can do its readings and it'll tell us if we, need, if we are now free and it generates a new path in relation to the canine. And we start the simulation. Again, we just need a little bit of patience. for it to do its calculation. And we've got it done. And let's see if we did a good job or if we need to eliminate a little bit more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have brought now the function directly on that canine. Notice another element during the movement when it reaches the top part of the canine we start having a contact on the lateral. This is another contact that needs to be evaluated and needs to be kept in consideration. So reading the mapping of the movement is really very very interesting uh, and having a perfect understanding of the elements of abrasion in relation to the contacts themselves. This is what we do by performing a function analysis on, on the surface of the teeth. So at the end of everything, a, a, a mouth may appear beautiful, may appear uh, healthy, and if you consider this patient hasn't had one filling, 
and uh, hasn't had absolutely no no issues has never went through any type of ortho treatments but we can still see that the way that the dynamics has been set out uh, do bring to to some small little little complications it's nothing huge uh, some decisions need to be taken but this is the basics of <coughs> what relates to to a dynamic functional evaluation on um, on on a patient the, the, the procedures will be then repeated in relation to the other contacts that, that we need to evaluate. So my goal is going to be to eliminate this contact and see what happens on, on the movement of the canine. And once we have established and eliminated all these, these pre-contacts on the function, on um, the working and the non-working side of, uh, of the arch, uh, we will then <clears throat> have a better understanding of how we can move move through the second part of the procedure. It is true that once we get to the phase uh, where uh, we need to decide, we are going to create a functional a bite, a bite that is going to <coughs> be utilized for deprogramming the muscle situation. The technique and the ideas in relation to how we are going to make it is really, is really very, very simple. There's nothing complicated. We are we set a bite where we can, we set a plane where we focus the contacts on the interior area. Where is the lower jaw? Here it is. Okay. Where we focus on only the six anterior contacts. We absolutely eliminate the, the contacts on the posterior teeth. And through, uh, <coughs> through the process of balancing the six anterior contacts in the patient's mouth, Slowly, slowly, we <coughs> go through a, pro a deprogramming of the muscles when we know that they are in a, in a, in a relaxed position uh, where they absolutely have no pain. We will then establish the, the centric relation with a simple jig that we place on the interior teeth, pick up that bite, bring it back into the workflow, and basically repeat the whole procedure again just to make sure that any action that we are going to perform is going to be <coughs> with good intent and with the best accuracy possible. And basically with this, I have uh, said everything I need to say in relation to the articulator and the functional evaluation and how I usually use uh, this device in my laboratory. So, thank you all very, very much for attending. There is going to be Another session is going to be another two or three sessions in relation to uh, to this um, this workflow. Uh, the next one will be related to the, the the plane finder, where we are going to integrate all uh, uh, the interoral recordings and bring them into the workflow. And then probably the third part will be integrating uh, the plane analyzer with all the. Um, the custom recordings of, of, of the patient itself. So, uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, hope to see you all soon. All keep well and thank you very, very much.